Hi, everybody. Welcome to the third meeting of our Blue Ocean Shift book discussion group. Um, today's meeting, we're going to be discussing part two, step three, imagine where you could be. And um, this meeting is going to be hosted by Pete Underwood of Abingdon, Oxfordshire, UK. And um, we're going to be also experimenting with a, a different format uh, that Pete will tell you about. And uh, we're not going to go over any new members or old members that dropped out. We're just, we really want to just dump, jump right in. So Pete, take it away. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, hello, officially, everybody. And uh, hello to everyone else who might be listening off this. And before I go on, I've just seen my reflection in the webcam. I realised that I'm wearing a red T-shirt and a blue hoodie. Like. <laughs> Hey. That was totally unintended, but that, that worked out really well. Oh yeah, nice, nice. I'm blue. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm kind of making the shift to blue. That's right. Um, anyway, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, totally, uh, totally off point. But here we go. So um, the, the kind of plan for today, and um, my generation is going to be a little bit different to what we've done in the previous sessions, where we're going to try and get a bit more hands-on with tools from the book, um, because um, you know they're useful things, and, and I think. With this sort of stuff, um, it really helps uh, um, have some sort of experiential learning to really embed how these things will work for us and what we sort of think as we go through the process. So we'll try and put some of that in today. So um, kind of what we had in mind um, in terms of the session was um, just a quick, quick recap of what we covered last time because I think that was a really useful thing to do in the previous session. Then we'll tackle the questions um, that we um, contribute to. And we'll try and sort of our time box it so we have enough time to try and go through uh, building one of these um, business, uh, so by utility maps. And I've come up with um, several potential suggestions of what we could run through. Um, obviously, open to suggestion if we can find something better. And I've also created, um, which you guys won't be able to see, but I can share with you later, um, uh, Google Sheets to capture all this stuff. Um, so we can share that onto the Google later down the line. Um, so, uh, a quick recap of the last session um, was that we were basically looking at the, a couple of key models um, within the book, which was basically to understand you know, where you currently are and where potential value uh, might be um, sought. So, we were looking at the Pioneer um, Migrator Set Map, as well as the Strategy Canvas, and I think overall there were some positive vibes for the models, or the techniques. Um, and I provide a useful, a useful starting point um, to get you going with figuring out um, where you should be heading. Um, I think the sort of general consensus was that you know, if there's an opportunity to do some research uh, before or after um, running through those exercises, so you can have maybe like validate your assumptions a little bit. And, and I think in this section, uh, this um, current section we're talking about today, we've seen that a bit more in terms of the uh, sort of explicit sort of. Um, advice of getting out of and going and doing some fun research. So um, I think that kind of feeds back into that um, earlier section. Um, as well as taking the models and making them work for you. So I think it, um, one of the well, it's might be, it's might be a evening of it, talking about um, trying to use the models or uh, using these different lenses. So you might be looking at a B2C relationship, you might also be looking at the B2B relationships. A bit more than you're looking at how these five and say um, really early day startups um, as opposed to the large scale enterprises, which seems to be more focused on in the book. So, um, but I think the authors cover that and say, you know, make these work for you. And I think we've seen that again with the bio that as well. Um, and the other key point that was talked about was getting the right team together because you need to have the right people in the right room with um, sort of clear expectations of what um, is going to be going on. And have some key sort of roles in place um, to make it possible, such as the team leader or the conciliary or deputy. Um, whether you could achieve that or not um, is another thing, but that was the kind of starting point. So, um, so I think that section of the book set us up nicely to establish where we're going, um, and then moving on to this section, we'll talk about today, is where we're trying to get to. Um, so that was kind of my take on the previous sections. Anyone else have any kind of 
Got any insights they want to add to that list? I guess not. <laughs> That's yeah. good. <laughs> Okay, just so, one comment, Pete. Um, I don't know if your mic can be moved closer to you to your mouth. <laughs> I certainly can. That's probably easier to do that than move my mouth to the mic. So, yeah. Yeah. I might make me sit in my webcam there, so apologies for that. If it gets very bad, I'll just change my headset. So. Um, Thanks. So, um, so, that kind of closes that sort of stage of the session today. So, um, the next kind of key section is going to be talking about um, the idea of uh, putting one of these bio utility maps together. Um, so I think James got a couple of suggestions of maybe doing one for Slack or for Amazon. Um, Melanie's written my idea that I haven't read yet. And what if we do a bigger and for buyer experience that is currently subpar and likely to low hanging opportunities? Um, which is a good point, actually, that's something I thought about, you know. The way it's presented in the book is very much, you know, this is the happy path and the block is along the happy path. Mm. But what if you deviate from that, say you need to return a product or if something goes wrong, you need to get in touch with some services, for example, how does that work out? So, um, yes, yeah, so maybe we can explore that in the later part of the session when we want to start to go doing one of these by your team maps. Um, before we get to that, though, is everyone up for having a go at creating one of these maps? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I think I was thinking just that if we if we pick a business that's or industry that's too strong, like all of our our squares will be filled in with positive findings. True. Right. And then, but then I was realizing since this is such an international group, like getting your driver's license at the DMV is horrible here in the U.S. <laughs> like maybe that doesn't resonate with the people in the U.K. and Sweden. But so, like, I mean, even something like going to the grocery store might not be a bad one. You know, you have to drive there. You have to remember what you need to buy. You have to bring it home. Like because there are opportunities when you start looking at all those axes on the left hand side. Yeah, for sure. That, yeah, you know, that was my thought process there. No, no, it's a, it's a great point and something I was thinking about too. And I was chatting with Jamie about the idea of trying to, uh, because we're often working, we're trying to find experiences that are coming to us, um, so we can we, we can identify with customers better, regardless of um, uh, what organisation you work for today. So, um, okay, well that, that sounds good. And if, and if you're up for that, would be great for to try and tackle later. So. Um, I think what would be good though is just to go through uh, the questions that we've come up with. Um, I was sort of planning to sort of spend up to 30 minutes doing this. We might not need that long potentially. And um, if we don't, that'd be great because then we can sort of dive more into the, uh, the exercise. So um, if we start with that, um, I'm not big headed, so I'm not going to go first, even though my question's first in minutes. <laughs> I'll save myself the last. So, um, Jamie, do you want to? Um, sort of Introduce your question or point. Sure. I'm sharing my screen just in case and everyone probably has the doc open. Um, well, I was just suggesting we do it for Slack or Amazon, but that was, again, approaching it from the co a company and a Slack. Both of those are actually both successful companies in their own right. Very different. Um, and so Melanie's, I, Melanie's idea of thinking about the utility, even maybe pretending we are from a company, let's say Uber, and trying to do something like a bird. I don't know if you've heard about those, but I think that's probably the right way to go. You're right. Um, let's see. We're, we were asking about the ones I put out there. I, the, well, the, I, was, I was thinking more, yeah, so I mean, I was thinking we could maybe come back to that later in the session. I was thinking about bypassing my sort of point two and, and moving on to the point three. Uh, this comment you made. Okay, this, okay, good. All right, so my other comment below yours was, um, and this is nothing against the authors again, this is more against my, um, you know, I was just surprised to see this in there. Uh, this notion that stakeholders need to get out and experience their own customer experience. You know uh, that this I, this notion felt obvious to me. Like they're saying, like a lot of stakeholders at companies, they never actually like. Let's say they work at a bank, go through what it's like to be a customer trying to open an account. Um, and you would think to me that by this point, that people who run these businesses have at least read maybe uh, 
you know, um, a book by Steve Blank about customer discovery, or a book, by, or a book by, or a user research or ethnography, an ethnography book, or, or, uh, or, or lean startup, or any of this stuff, or anything on user research. Like it's like I, I or it, it's just kind of sad to me to think that there's still companies out there that think like by doing focus groups. Um, or maybe talking to their frontline support that they, you know, that they're, they're not experiencing their own product experience. Um, I was, I threw it out there because is this, is this just like a notion that's just like, they're kind of not, uh, is, is it, is this prevalent in, in the world or, or is it that I, or we live in a bubble of user experience, user experience, research, product strategy, of where it's a given that you would go out and do these things. That was well, I was, I was going to say, I was happy to read today that the new head of the New York City Transit Organization rode the subway to work today. And it kind of reminded me of this. You know, like in the book, they were talking about all the auto executives who had this high level of service for their vehicles and just never experienced the real customer experience. So, yeah, I mean, I guess I would come down on the side of maybe we're in a little bit of a bubble because you do drink the Kool-Aid once you start thinking this way and you're, it just becomes part of your blood to think this way that you would start with the customers. Um, my comment on that is uh, I think also that you'll live in a little bit isolated world with the user experience uh, and user research. Unfortunately, I think it's not applied in uh, many companies because of uh, many various reasons, although they are like uh, understand the need, maybe they didn't invest in that, or maybe they organize that in a wrong way. That uh, like user research belongs to development or product organization, so that they cannot perform their work in a real way. And also another thing that we are also experienced in my current work is that B two B business and B two C. So as we came up to this conclusion last time, that we should. I think you should focus on the end user and their experience, but uh, it's not always easy when you are in a B2B business. So I think it's um, a lot of uh, situations that it's not so easy and so trivial to, although we should think uh, UX driven products and services, but it's not executed in that way. <laughs> it's just my opinion. Well, I, I, I think like, in, in nothing else I was adding, I feel like if this is true, then it might explain why all of a sudden, to me at least, from the clients that are calling, the type of work they're asking me to do is this movement for especially people who get up the ladder as far as being, uh, you know, UX, uh, you know, product leaders and then move into company process optimization is why we're seeing all these digital transformation jobs is that that must be part of it is that they need that to be baked into the process because uh because certainly i know i live in a california bubble so maybe it's it was just interesting to me to see that they actually have to tell people to go experience their product in a book like this um and maybe that's why we're seeing uh, the work that we do, the, the, the processes that we do become all of a sudden highlighted by all of these companies, particularly out of the tech sector. I think that's a good thing though, isn't it? Because I mean, talking about this in this kind of frame is that, you know, we're, we're probably in a silo just as much as every other discipline is, even if we think that we can see cross, you know, silo. Um, but I guess what this book does is, if it's meant to be read by a general audience, um, one, you're right, Jamie, it exposes them to the idea of going and doing user research, which is where we can come in and help. Um, but it also allows us to maybe work with tools that they are comfortable with um, and talk to them in ways that maybe we haven't done before, or at least we have a shared language now or a shared platform to work on to say, let's all do this together, which is what the book is trying to get us to do anyway. So, you know. I'm sure there's people from all sorts of disciplines reading this and saying, why don't people do that, blah, 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 you know, which maybe as uh, UX people, you know, wouldn't necessarily fit naturally with what we would think our scope is, maybe. So, it's a book for everybody. <laughs> maybe. Agreed. That's the tagline. Tag <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, a book for leaders of all kinds of companies. Yeah, which um, you know is a pretty big aspiration to aim for. With it, so you know, well done for them for trying it. Um, so, cool. Any, any further comments on that, or should we move along? Cool. Okay, let's push on. Then. So, um, mine um, was a, a quite a quick one, really. It's it, it just something that sort of stuck out to me. I was reading a case study about the um, City University that was trying to work out how it could compete against. Um, other private universities and, and sort of public universities. And there was a, not exactly a link in your miss it moment, but it was a, 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 a subtle but important point where I think they went through the process of reaffirming what their um, value proposition was. So I think it's on page 181 of the book where they run through the exercise of everyone agreeing that you know, we are trying to deliver this, this, and this for this, these sorts of reasons, which to me was their value proposition. Um, and that then allowed them to move forward to say, right, yeah, that's definitely what we're trying to achieve, right, how are we going to now go and um, do that, and um, what's that going to turn into? Um, and so it, it just made me think, it seems such a useful thing to do, would it have been worth maybe making it a more um, a, a form, formalised part of the process, even, even if it didn't need to necessarily be launched in the book? Uh, for me personally, if I was going to run through this book with a client, um, I suspect I would probably want to be doing that before we moved on to, um, you know, working on any of the other techniques. Um, so that, I, I don't know whether that sort of resonated with any of you guys as well when you did that case study. Yeah, I was thinking about that because I saw last night that you had put that in the document and then I vaguely remembered when they did the strategy canvas, did they have some part there about like having a tagline for your business? Yep. And I wonder if for them, would that work for this? Or is that your tagline of where you are rather than where you want to go? So mm. I wasn't sure where that fit in. And I couldn't even find where they talked about the tagline. But Yeah, you were actually. And I'm, I remember that now. And, I, and, and, I, and also I was thinking, yeah, yeah you, might, you might capture your tagline or your value proposition now. But potentially if you're going to start going after a load of non-customers, you know, that might not work for them. And, and, you know, are you going to have to change your value proposition for them? And if you do, are you then going to start dropping current customers? Um, you know, how, how, do you, how do you find that balance? Because, you know, if your non-customers are non-customers, that might be for a reason. It's because you're doing what you're doing. You know, so, yeah, it's trying, right. to, trying, to, trying to keep everybody happy would be a quite tricky thing to do, I think. Um, I have um, one comment on that. Um related to that uh, horizon one, two, and three that we mentioned mm. last time. It's not part of the Blue Ocean strategy, but uh, part of how you innovate your business operation model. And it's at like horizon one, it's where you are today. You have a uh, already established business model, operational model, and the value proposition is part of your business operational model. Horizon two, you just uh, are improving and little bit innovating the business operational model, but it's still like the same. But Horizon 3 is where you can re-innovate and uh, change your business operational model. And maybe there is when you change your value proposition. So you discover here is a group of non-customers that I would like to untap. And then you like work on Horizon 3. And then you create, um, you, you understand what I mean? And then, then you can change your business operational model. I don't think so that... Uh, it's good to change your value proposition when you are in horizon one, then it will be strange like to change uh, that then. But yeah. you are expecting in order to reconstruct that for horizon three. It's just my vision on that. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is just when I saw that, like this tagline idea, I mean, it's basically wordsmithing. And like, for instance, when I did discovery phase for, for Oprah, you know, the first thing we did with all the stakeholders in the room was just like, okay, everyone say what did they think is the mission statement or the vision statement for o for the new Oprah site. And it was just like this throwing up all these words, you know, buzzwords or different words to like talk about, you know, the redesign, but not really what the value was for the end user. And it feels like, to me, it just felt like, again, kind of this sort of, obvious thing that you would do for a company that didn't have a strategy team that didn't have a company they worked with that helped them focus on 
what is our tagline? How are we positioning ourselves? Like this was real kind of one on one strategy stuff to me um, around those things that felt obvious. Like the book was trying to cater toward uh, or not lo overlook these things. Um, that that you know to me like for a, for a company that's been around for several years should know. And the last thing I'll say is you know that they would. Especially when you're a company that's like, um, you know, these, t let's say there's a com number one company in the field that's just killing it and has the largest market share. And then all of a sudden you're number two or three that you have to differentiate yourself. And so when you start looking across everybody's vision statements and they have the same words, then they become meaningless. Mm -hmm. And for me, also, then the uh, tagline, it's um, as I understood that it's related to that uh, focus that you have to have a focus in the strategy. And uh, I agree, it's uh, like more strategy work, not only blue ocean. But for example, as Apple has think different, for me, it's a compelling tagline that you have some short, you know, uh, um, tagline for your strategy. Yeah, and I mean, the other thing that occurs to me as we're talking through this is that maybe, like in the context of step three um, in this process, if you can make your value proposition sufficiently um, like general, that might be helpful. So like in the example of this um, credit card processing in Square, maybe the value proposition wouldn't be so specific as saying, you know, we, ex we allow people to use credit when shopping at large businesses. Maybe it's, you know, we allow people to use digital payment forms in transactions. So to make it something that was really wide open in general and didn't restrict you to exactly what you're doing now and left room through being general to find new customers and new spaces to innovate. I agree. I completely agree. But on the other side, it's so like... Um, uh, uh, difficult on the other side you should not be too general then you don't you, you know then uh, the vision or mission or strategy is um, not saying what you are exactly doing so it's maybe a problem with the people who are working for that company they don't see the clear what they are supposed to strive for but the uh, agree it should be general enough to cover changes and open new customers also specific enough to get people from the company understand. Maybe it's like a core value that just strips away the extras and gets to like the fundamental bare bones value. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think in the butt and perhaps the value innovation, you know, what makes this company unique. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, some really interesting points there, and I, and I think that's all relevant. Because I think it's uh, one of these things that you, um, you know, it's important, and we said this multiple times, it's important that the author state certain things because without them, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't know about these things, you'd be building strategy and shaky grounds. So it's good to cover this stuff. Um, but I think it's important, and I think we're touching upon this again to make it work for you. Um, because you know, you might what might seem really niche to somebody might be like a massive, you know, opportunity to innovate versus keeping it really general. So I guess it's kind of a um, as the other thing. It's always about the context, isn't it? But um, but I liked your point about where could where could this be like formalized in the process? Where does everybody think would be a good like? It, could we assign it to one of the steps so that that becomes part of our thinking about how you apply this method? Like, would that be? Mm -hmm. At the strategy canvas point, or it might be after the after the buyer utility map. We'll find out. Okay. Yeah, because I, I, I guess the idea of that is trying to expose where that value is going to come from for the customers. So you might you might not even necessarily have one, or at least a, like a, a work in progress one, and then that might blow the doors wide open. You know, you can chuck the old one out and create a new one. Maybe let, let's see. Um, you never know if we get if we get that far tonight, we might even create our own one. <laughs> so, um, see, but okay, that, let's uh, uh, move on. So, David, there's a couple of questions for you. Would you like to introduce your first point? It's four, five, and six. I moved him, David. Oh, okay. 
David. Maybe. Maybe. Well, I'll, uh, I'll read the questions out and if David can join us later, that'd be awesome. Um, so, the first one is um, sort of feeling um, positive at 6x6 grid and having um, 36 field which helps create consensus fast. Um, even if many might be um, upset or comfortable seeing some of the posts, I guess the post notes. Um, I've seen this data as a point where it's used in other contexts before where it generates discovery and consensus. Have we seen it too? Um, I personally haven't, so that's quite a short answer. <laughs> 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 have, you, have you guys ever seen this sort of thing happen before? No, I haven't seen either. No. I haven't seen either. Yeah. Yeah. Is he not talking, or is he? He's talking about that. Have we not seen this grid in any other context, or did the Blue Ocean team invent it? Uh, well, based on what we just said, I'm guessing, guessing they just invented it. So, uh, um, I mean, I, I've seen things. I mean, so for example, I've seen um, you know experience maps before, um, yeah. and and you would probably capture similarish sort of information on it. Um, but just in a totally different format. Um, and you might have to borrow from other techniques as well, so put in some bits, and bits of it. But, um, but, it, but it seems like a, a, you know, a good way of capturing a lot of the key information um, and just spending it. I mean, I, for me, like one of the key points of, of, uh, or messages that the authors are trying to get across is keeping things simple um, so everyone can um, keep stuff in the front of their minds and just make documents workable. Rather than having like a, you know, a humongous spreadsheet capturing everything, you know, just really boil it down to the, the essentials because they're probably still enough to work work with. Um, yeah, well, what did you guys think about this this particular technique? I have to do one. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I was I was thinking that it does remind me a lot of just like conventional like journey mapping that we might see in a UX context. And and then like once I put that together, oh, that's kind of what this is. What I really liked about it was that it had these like organized six, this framework of six things to think about um, where the current experience might not be delivering. Because I think sometimes when you're doing a journey map, you're I mean, you're either going by something that someone tells you, which might not capture the full spectrum of issues, or you're thinking about it from some through some lens. And so I liked that this was almost like a brainstorming technique that would force you to look at each step in the process from a number of different angles that you might not otherwise think about. Yeah, I'm pasting a filled out one in here. Um, I guess I looked at it, first of all, I, I want to do one, um, but to me it felt, um, I, I have a couple chapters dedicated to doing competitive analysis um, of indirect and direct competitors, and in part of that is, by, is looking at their experience, um, and this seems like really diving deep into the product experience at a higher level um, so that you can see who's really killing at uh, some of these things and then trying, you know, here the example I'm showing is for Indochina um, and then saying, wow, okay, so, you know, where are in this example with the X's and the O's, you know, where, you know, who, who if this was a per competitor, and you said, okay, this is the first competitor, the second competitor, or what? Are you looking at it for patterns? Like, well, everybody provides good maintenance, so we must. But look at the lapse of delivery and use. Um, you know that it takes it to a, a deeper level of understanding by comparing the experiences across um, of, of 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 understanding the competition from the uh, customer experience level. That is a really cool idea. Yeah, I think that that, that does make a lot of sense because I, I, I guess really, you know, although in the previous step when you're doing your um, strategy canvas, you're explicitly capturing what the industry is doing. Um, you know, there's the you know potentially you know you could lose sight of you know um, what you know all that competitor analysis if you don't keep that flowing through the process. Um, because I guess you need to make all the decisions within that context of the, of the market, don't you? So that, that makes a lot of sense. 
Um, cool. Um, yeah. Good question, David. <laughs> you know I had to talk about it. <laughs> good one, um, David. Yeah. yeah. Um, Let's see what next. else. Here's this next one, Pete. Sure. Okay. So, um, next question, David, was what kind of previous agreement must have been put in place before such a workshop could take place? Uh, under which conditions would, could any average facilitator send top executives out to the field? Um, so, uh, by the sounds of it, we're talking about not just the workshop, but also the you know the primary research on what the authors were promoting um, to sort of you know make sure that any doubts that these were actually probably going to be cast aside. So, um, yeah, what are, what are your thoughts on on, on that? Dave, is your mic working yet? David? Yep. Yeah. Typing. Yeah. All right, David, why don't you call me on my phone uh, so that I can loop you in? Is that okay? I don't know if I really want to put my phone number in the <laughs> sky. <laughs> okay. Uh, go ahead and repeat it. Uh, we'll we'll jump to Melanie and Chris and come back to David. I think. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's a good plan. So, yeah, Melanie, Melanie, do you want to introduce your your question? Yeah. Sure. So I was just uh, starting to think to like in practical terms, what would this look like to do like. Um, I think the motive, so my question is, we've now read through steps one through three that show how to figure out where your company and offering is today and how to motivate and like build a team. So that was steps one and two, and then how to figure out where there's new opportunities, which is step three. And then I just started wondering about sort of the time frame for this because um, it seemed like steps two and three could be done pretty quickly. You know, the strategy canvas and maybe this, you know, some of this competitive analysis, the plum analysis. <laughs> We're coining a new acronym, the buyer utility map. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I wondered about like how long people, you know, thought that the, these steps would take and what would be a good format to do them um, if you were coming in as a consultant. Yeah. So I guess they, uh, should I take it or? Yeah, I basically, yeah, I was going to say. Because, because uh, I'm running, I'm facilitator of such type of workshops with my company. So we said it's a just experiment. So uh, we are running it at uh, two hours each workshop. And um, on the first one, we did that um, pioneer migrator settler map and uh, as is uh, strategy canvas. On the second workshop, we did the buyer utility map oh. and then managed just the first year of non customers. And then on the next workshop, so each is two hours, we managed to do second and the third tier of non-customers and started with that uh, six-part framework. But uh, what we feel, our like reflection, we are not uh, blue ocean strategies, that we are professional, that um, it's going too, too fast. We have to have like uh, w w one occurrence when we can go through what we concluded, because it feels that you cannot just find a blue ocean just like uh, you create that uh, book map and say, oh, look at this, here is Blue Ocean. You have to redo that several times. It's just, just my personal uh, um, ex impression. So it's good to collect, but I think all of these workshops should be run within uh, different maybe forums several times. And after a while, that idea will start come to like, we should focus on this and this and this. So from my experience. And like, how much time do you have between those two hour workshops? Like, would there be like a week and then you come back and do another two hour workshop or? We run, because it's just like a experimental project. So we are not, we are run once a month. Because oh, okay. I have to, to, to gather all uh, right people in the room and you know, people are busy all the time. But uh, we have a good mixture of uh, uh, head of development apart departments, uh, heads of um, product department, commercial, so we have a good uh, mixture of people, as it, as it is recommended in the book. Mm? 
So are you saying you when you say like an experimental project, do you mean it's like a like a pilot sort of to see if this will work? In a re- yes, you know? it's more we experience that uh, uh, we we like the idea and we think that each exercise is uh, eyes opening. You know, you you learn something. So even uh, if it is not maybe that you're going to find a, a real blue ocean one day, it's going. They're very help, helpful to start thinking that way. To start observing, maybe those things are good candidates for improvement and so on. And to be aware about, uh, to learn more about the company, about the industry, your competitors. So we we are just running that because we think it's uh, good things to learn more about ourselves and the competition. Well, it's, it's really interesting to hear your sort of you know experience in this meeting because um, you know thinking about. You know, if I was coming at this from a, a, an agency or consultancy perspective, you know, if, if a client came and said, "I think, you know, we think we'd like to do some strategy work," um, typically the way things work with us is, uh, you know, in our industry, certainly in the UK, anyways, you, you pitch for the work, you submit proposal, and that will detail costs and time scales and planned activities. But it kind of sounds like, at least, for, you know, at least if this is a new process for an organisation. You almost need to go to the clients and say, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to play it by it to a certain extent, which, which you know, is fine because you want to make sure that the process works. But it's just an interesting conversation to have, um, you know, if, 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 you know, especially even as, an, as a consultant, if it's the first time you've done it and you're not quite sure, you know, how long it's going to take you to, to run that and, and manage the process and facilitate it and stuff. So it's, yeah, it's an, an interesting challenge to take on, I think. Yes, and uh, I think one very important thing is uh, that they didn't uh, uh, emphasize in the book. It, uh, you you need a lot of time for reflection. That you really set your thoughts and thinks about all ideas all out of the workshops. It's not only run a workshop, then we have a clear picture and continue. You, you need to have a time to reflect, to think about everything that uh, you got. Hmm? Yeah. And, and I think, and I think, seems like serious, like hardcore project management skills as well. Because I think if you are gonna have to get, you know, people within, I mean, I know that's where you set it up, but I, but I could quite imagine that, you know, if you're particularly dealing with senior people, that you might have to schedule like monthly meetings, you know, making sure, you know, they're refreshed about what was spoken about last time, so they can come prepped and make the most out of their time in the meeting. You know, there's all, there's a lot of underlying planning and logistics that seems to be necessary, which I'm sure would come out as you start doing it yourself. Um, mm. But it, it, it does seem like quite a, you know, quite a task to undertake, I think. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Super. So we move on to the next question? Oh, yeah. is Dave, are you, uh, are you back on the this now? Thanks, okay. So I think we skip one of your questions, which might be a, a good one to come back to now, which is, um, your question number five. So, do you want to um, introduce us to, to question five? Question number five. Yes. Okay, at the very end of chapter eight, it says that they rarely met any team that wasn't initially reluctant. And I'm thinking for all the other processes, steps here, some of the top level people are going to be re- reluctant. So, how do you handle that? Does it happen? That's a good question. What do you guys think, Beth? I think it's going to depend on the circumstance. Uh, And just from dealing with the clients that bring me in for strategy, sometimes they have complete buy-in from the C-suite to bring in someone. like me to an outsider to help them, uh, you know, build consensus and and work with them on a roadmap for strategy. And in other cases, the C-suite people aren't involved at all and it's just the head of product and they're basically using people like us to come up with a strategy and then ultimate, so it's in the back, in their back pocket and then they can go in and um, you know, helpful, hopefully, uh, get the C suite team on board. Um, but I feel like you know, to your point, it's it's an uphill battle if 
if the CSV people think, oh, everything we're doing is fine, uh, it needs to be presented to them that, hey, we have these incoming threats from indirect competitors, from newcomers, and for us to stay competitive, we would like to involve you in this very important exercise, uh, you know, group effort, and your presence there would represent um, that you know that that you you know that that you care. <laughs> well, and, and what this makes me think about is how they've emphasized the element of humanness in this and the whatever they call it, fair process and, and getting everyone involved. Because a big part of what they're doing throughout the book is motivating people, especially in the early steps, to be concerned that they need to do this or they're not going to be viable in the future. Like with the pioneer settler migrator map, a big part of that is to sort of light a fire under people. So maybe to the extent that you can get the you know top top executives to, to be a part of that, it will help motivate support for the initiative as a whole because they'll realize they have to do it. Yeah, I think it's very contextual to the business. You know, it could be government, it could be a bank, and or it could be a tech company. And I think depending on the makeup of the people there and their attitudes and how long they've been in business, it's gonna be, you know, we have to be able to do this, these things, whether they're gonna be there or not. And then ultimately, it, it, it's a waste of time if we can't if if the output of it isn't presented in a way to the big decision makers so that they understand what happened with this why why this meeting what was the purpose of the meeting and what was the outcome of the meeting and the learnings uh, so they get it with actions with actionable uh, I think that's a big part is like here, here's our recommendations of, of, of where we could potentially go um, as opposed to them like giving them something like a research brief or a strategy brief like that you know, they want to know like here's a, a one slide that's like a three or four different ideas of what we you know uh, you know I, I think a lot of it is is presentation to them uh, I mean that's my take because they're busy and they're just like kind of don't sometimes trust people from the outside and all these different methodologies and so forth. Yeah, it's, and it's an interesting point. So I mean, uh, not that it necessarily changes um, the, the pressure, but you know, say if we were going to be delivering that message to um, the, the C-suite, it doesn't necessarily change our desire to do a good job, but I suppose it's if, if we're taking this approach, we, we still need to nail it and um, for them to see the benefit of it, and then maybe then get buying from them to come in on board for the next project that we would do. I guess you would do that with anything, but it's you know, but yeah, right. Presenting things in the right way and using the right language, I think, is is, is always going to be key to trying to get someone else's uh, buying. Um, I mean, have, I mean, have you? had an experience, you know, going through your process of, of having to, um, or trying to get people out and, you know, and live, live the customer experience, yeah? Mina? Uh, yes, yes, I'm just thinking. <laughs> what, so we, uh, yes, it's, uh, now we are just doing that internally, it's the next step how we can do that uh, with our customers. It's uh, of course it's just uh, our perspective and vision on things. So <laughs> we we can't reach that uh, yet. But we know. I mean, as I say, we are just running this because we think it's a very nice systematic approach. How you can uh, analyze yourself, market, industry, competition. But um, with the learnings from this, we are going probably to proceed and uh, to do some uh, exercises to run that with our customers. Mm. Okay. Which is good, I think, because I think that's a, that's a slightly different tack to you know taking the you know the example that the authors gave in the book of you know getting someone to pretend to be um, sick and having to go through the you know the healthcare service, which um, you know you know whichever approach you take, I guess there's there's pros and cons to all of it. But you know it's interesting. I mean, you're taking the approach of getting users in because when you know. 
in my experience, when you get stakeholders to hear the words coming straight out of customers' mouths, um, that there's not a lot of denying that that stuff got so <laughs> and that it's important. So mm-hmm. that's a really, really interesting approach you're taking. Um, Dave, have you got any sort of other any other points you'd like to add to your your own discussion topic? Sorry. Oh, yeah. well, I, I guess yeah, that was another thing. So, um, so well, we're pretty much at the point where I was hoping to move on to the the bio utility map. Do we hit Chris's got, question? I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say we've got one more question from Chris. So um, it seems it seems um, like a good plan to sort of round round the section out the last question. So. Um, Chris's question is um, that uh, I'm on the digital CFC at a large corporation, and most um, VPs, executives, stakeholders, etc., are less understanding of the buyer's point of view. Um, since we're talking about compiling a buyer utility map, um, I'm thinking about all the data sources that would create an accurate view, or at least to make sure that each team comes with pairs, um, which means a non which is sample size based on the channel or segment. Does anyone on the team have the experience there? <laughs> that sounds like it might be a no. <laughs> I mean, they did mention it in the book. I, at that point, they said if, if, the, if there's a sense on the part of the facilitator that the answers are not really solid or that you know there isn't that sense of empathy or understanding of the customers, that's when you are supposed to somehow push them out the door to go find out, which, as David points out, could be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but particularly if you if you um, you know work or supply into an industry that you don't happen to actually work anywhere near. <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I I might build nuclear power rods. I don't think a, a nuclear power station is going to just let me walk through the door because you know I asked them. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, I, I feel like. I, oh, go ahead, Pete. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say you're just about. Um, I mean, I was thinking then in that case, you know. That's when potentially you are then starting to rely on secondary data sources, um, whatever, whatever for make on them, you know. Yeah, I feel like for in the real world, uh, you know, because uh, obviously in, in tech they can, uh, you know, check out all the competitors online, but for stuff that's off the funnel, you know, not only I would take them if I could on a field trip to experience their own customer experience but to then go to their competitors and experience it there i mean if they're that out of touch um that so they could really understand um you know how you know how they need to either catch up or uh you know think about delivering their services in new ways yeah i mean I, 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 oh so go ahead well, I was just going to say another thought that came to my mind was that maybe you could approach the buyer utility map as like an exercise where you even sort of like farmed out squares to people to go do some secondary research and try to fill them in. Yeah, that's a great idea. Or even have exactly. a bunch of people fill them in and then compare them. Yeah, I was thinking that too, because throughout the book, they keep talking about that sort of time tested method for eliciting ideas by having individuals do it and then put it all together, see where the overlaps are, build consensus. Mm-hmm. And the so find the gap is the homework or something, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, one yeah, comment that is also if you don't have a like um, chance or opportunity to do that with your customer, maybe you can squeezing in those questions in then a customer satisfaction survey or something in order to get answers in that way and through that channels and so on. But probably there are a lot of ways how you can gather these answers. Hmm? Yeah. And uh, just another comment. Unfortunately, I have to drop off now. I have to leave a little bit earlier today. So uh, good luck with the boom map and uh, with the results <laughs> afterwards. Hmm? Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks so much, Nina. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thanks, Peter. See you next week. Well, um, seems we've just lost the only person that's done one of these. That'll <laughs> 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 be an interesting next like, half an hour or so, but we will, we will soldier on it, but, you know, as true professionals. I feel um, like we should jump into it and do one. Yeah, let's get on with that. That's a good idea. 
Cool. Okay, so I think there's a few options that we've got here. So Jenny mentioned um, Amazon and uh, Slack earlier. Um, David, I think you popped in uh, an odd suggestion for doing just transport in general. Um, I, I came up with some in thinking, uh, um, you know, putting ourselves in the position of Apple and looking at the sort of um, buyer experience for smartphones. Um, or a duplicate with Amazon thinking about voice assistant devices, as I think they're you know rapidly becoming yep. um, you know a major battleground for a few large large tech companies. Sure. Uh, um, or uh, Uber thinking about ride sharing um, as opposed to sort of solo taxi riding, just as a slightly off piece option maybe. So um, I, I, I don't I have no sort of preference for really. anything. They they seem sort of decent. Do, do you guys have a, a, a uh, they're all leaders. Well, first of all, these three. Um, and the competitors, for I feel like. I don't know which would be a good one. We lost me at like uh, to. To do it. Well, I mean, smartphones might not be such a bad one because even though they are so wonderful, we do all experience problems with our smartphones and we're all pretty familiar with using smartphones. So maybe, you know, even though it seems like, oh, this is a better product, it's been around for a long time, there's there's room to do better. Yeah. 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 Or we could just make it easy on ourselves and choose something that is a really subpar experience and, and there's lots of room for improvement. Well, my, my, my feeling is that kind of depending on what time everyone has to leave today, unless we can all hang on to midnight, or whatever the time's over, um, it, it might take as well. I mean, if, if Mina's estimate of, of two hours of two hours a session is is going to go by, we're probably going to capture a, a small part of this anyway. So, um, you know, it, just for the sake of doing example, it might not matter so much which one we pick. Yeah, so, that's um, true. So, um, I mean, I. Uh, I think smartphones would be an interesting one to go for because, you know, like I said, we could all think of things that would probably be better about our phones. And maybe if thinking about it, you know, we don't have to set this approach, but if we were going to take it from a, you know, as a, as a new sort of tech startup, you know, that's a pretty daunting marketplace to, to jump into. So, okay, let's make, do it. Maybe there's something there. Yeah, yeah that's okay. good. So, so I've got, um, oh, it's, yeah, if you could flip onto the spreadsheet uh, for us, Jen, yeah. and I'll just fill it in as we go. Um, so I think the plan with, in, in terms of, uh, I re reread the chapter um, today just to make sure I knew how to do this in properly, um, so they misrepresent the, the method. Um, so the plan would basically be that we think about um, the buyer experience of smartphones through the various different stages of the experience, so the buyer experience cycle, um, and, and I guess we need to think about you know, whether those are actually um, still um, okay, or whether we need to add some, change some, take some away. Um, then the plan would be to talk about, we can quickly brainstorm the activities associated with each of that stage of the cycle. So I've actually stuck in an extra row here, where we could just put one quickly, because then the, the second stage, or the next stage would be to say, okay, well, um, what are the key blockers, say within the, the purchase um, phase, um, along um, when you think about the different utility levers that are available which are up here now. So what, what I thought would be useful is if we capture the activities then hopefully that will just, and we can delete them later, but at least it will be up there so we can sort of maybe identify, okay, this activity is going to bring the most amount of pain um, and here's some description of where that pain is coming in. Um, or indeed what might work is that we find that um, the most amount of pain for say customer productivity comes from one activity but mm. most of the pain from something else comes from a different activity. So maybe we can just play with it and see how we get on. So, um, I mean, the first thing I would think of is before I, you know, purchase a phone, and, and I probably would class this for me as a distinct phase, is just searching and, and selecting a phone. Um, I don't know whether you guys think that deserves a separate column here or whether that's... Um, uh, uh, can be wrapped up into the purchase phase. What do you think? Mm. Oh yeah, I need to share with you guys access. 
Mm-hmm. Let's just wrap it up into the purchase phase for now, just so, you know, as we're thinking about it. I and I agree with that one that, you know, figuring out the features and the specs on any electronic device is. Yep. Okay, so um, and comparing devices, I suppose, aren't we? Really? And that might be under customer productivity where that's a pain point because it's um, using up our time and our effort. Yeah. It's, um, so how do we um, go across the top or work our way down? Like, the, is it is it like we go this and this, or do we well, go this so way? The work, so according to the book, you work along the top first by identifying all the activities, um, and then you start working your way down. Um, Got it. So maybe, maybe if we if we are planning to um, stay online for like another what like thirty minutes or something, yeah, or we can work this with our friends. Okay, so. Maybe if we just maybe try the first three columns, uh, you know, work away from the first three columns and then start working down, so at least we can go in both dimensions. And then if we have some spare time done enough of that, we can try to put up some other sections of work. Does that sound like a plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're going to have to type in there just to get the notes. I I, I still have you only. Yeah. So, uh, no problem. So, um, so in terms of purchasing, then you've got. Um, I guess your initial comparison of devices. Um, one, two, so let's. What is the? I have on the right here the the thing uncovering the blocks. What is the biggest block to customer producti- productivity? What are the key reasons for this block? At the purchase level. So probably a large number of models to compare between whether that's within your product line or all across the whole spectrum. So I guess, um, yeah. Are you going to get that in there, Pete? You might have to stretch out these columns. So the yeah, issue, yeah. the issue is a uh, customer, is a uh, purchase, is there, what are the key reasons? Is, is that the biggest block is they're not in the purchase process they don't know which will be the most product productive uh, because I feel like for instance um, it's almost like buying a car the only way you know what car you want you get to test drive it and with phones uh, you don't get to test drive phones unless you try your friend's phone but it's never the same Yeah, so are we, so we want to sort of say... Um, well, so that's a great one. I mean, that would actually be somewhere else. You know, I wonder, maybe we do need a column for pre-purchase. Like, oh, we I really see. can't. So, can't but, try. And that would be under risk reduction. Yeah. Pre-purchase risk reduction would be you can't test drive a phone, typically. Although I suppose in the Apple store you can, but... To some extent, but you can't really take it home and you know try it out. Yeah. Oh, David gave us a vote for the pre-purchase phase. Oh, okay. Uh, so we're modifying the canvas. <laughs> so we're gonna make yeah, so, it. You're gonna add a block, uh, a column. Yeah, I was gonna say because I've, I've added stuff on my my screen. I don't know why you guys can't see it on yours oh, for some reason. That's quirky. Hmm. Uh, I can make a copy of this. Oh, it's not going to give me view. Uh, and so I've, I've just given you guys um, an editing that as well. So I think that if you click on that, I don't know why you can't see what I'm, I'm up to. Unless you're on a different worksheet. Um, maybe Jamie, I've, I've put up three different worksheets. Whoa. Oh, oh it didn't update on, on the Skype. There it is there. Um, Magic has happened. Okay. Cool. Oh, okay, so right, we're back on track. So, yes, yeah, so you've got pre purchase. So, effectively, yeah, you're comparing devices. I guess you want to, you know, that could be online as well as like the same thing. And you actually just put the points in your hands and test drive it yourself. Um, no, maybe you make some one and you can buy those. That's another option, I suppose, isn't it? But um, I think, yeah, that, that's a big, a big issue, isn't it? Um, 
Um, I, I guess also um, there's an element of trying to make direct comparisons because you might not always be able to make, say, you know, direct sort of value comparisons between stuff. And um, so I guess maybe with that kind of risk reduction block potentially. Um, you can't always compare them to other phones like Android versus yeah, iOS yeah. or something. Yeah, that's probably risk reduction, the risk of making a wrong choice, I guess. Yeah. So in a way, you'd like to test drive a whole panel of phones. You'd sort of like to have a Warby Parker of phones where they would send them to you and you could use them for a week and keep the one you liked or something. Yeah. Or just send them on eBay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can't use to, maybe it's oh, you can't just to test a phone or compare to others. Or compared to other, yeah, competitors. Yeah, cool. So I guess ultimately we've got to try and pull this down to one statement that we so, um, yeah, maybe we'll try and rationalize that a bit later, maybe. Um, so, um, yeah, um, well, I was just going to say in terms of purchase, there's a convenience factor because I think typically you do go physically to a store to buy your phone. Right? I've never bought a phone. I mean, I guess maybe I, well, I feel like I've always gone to the store to buy a phone. Okay, so so we're saying that's the, that, so the, the, the hassle of getting to the store to do that, are you saying that's a, a block to convenience? Yeah, and so in the purchase space, that could be another block. I'm just looking for like low hanging fruit of yeah. <laughs> places where this map has opportunities. Sure. Right, we can um, think about also for people that don't live where all the Apple stores and, you know, who live out in the rural countries, they don't have access to to try the phone. Are we going with, did you make yours editable, Pete, or are we going with mine? No, it should be edited. I've just uh, changed the editing permission, so um, let me just send you guys a link. Uh, just throw it on Skype. David says he's bought phones by ordering them from Amazon, so but not with a trial. So our risk reduction one seems pretty solid. Yeah, and Apple lets you yeah. trial everything there. You can own it for up to a month and return it. Um, so they do have that. I mean, one thing I was thinking about in terms of um, the environmental friendly is now that sort of brands are having to sort of be a bit more transparent about their sort of corporate social responsibility and that sort of stuff. Um, is that, you know, traceability of the supply chain, where, where this, where all the components come from. Um, because I know a lot of companies have, have been sort of called up on, you know, maybe, at least on the face of it, slightly less than ideal supply chain setups. So I guess maybe um, difficult, difficult of tracing back through the supply chain. I mean, that last, uh, that sixth lever could almost be like a corporate responsibility mm -hmm. lever, which is environmental, but also human, um, because I know like phone companies have had issues with, with workers in um, foreign countries and things. Yeah. For simplicity, is it, like hassle of, uh, of, or complexity of knowing the, the options without trying them or, com or o overwhelmed by uh, uh, the options? That's how I feel when I have to buy anything electronic. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think um, also actually understanding what you actually need from a phone. Um, I mean, in, in the UK, what some phone companies decide to do in our comparison sites is just give you some kind of like a filtering process to go through to say, you know, how, how many calls do you make a month, how many texts do you send a month, you know, what's your video or your data usage like, and then they'll start suggesting phones for you. Um, before that came about, you know, there's a lot of fact. You know, if anyone could even be bothered, so they're digging through their bills to figure out what they actually use their phone for. Um, and, I, and I think the simplicity of comparisons 
Um, he's getting better, but it's, um, you know, maybe still not there. I think we could add that um, in the simplicity row under supplements. Yeah, supplements. That would include choosing your texting plan and your data plan, and those are so incredibly tiresome to sort through also to figure out what your best deal is and all of that. Mm. And also you can just like physical supplements like, you know, cases and screen protectors and stuff, you know. Right. Like, you know, for every smartphone there's like a bajillion different cases you can buy for it. So, <laughs> you know. But like sense. even the structuring of uh, how data plans and texting plans work, it really seems to be way more complicated than it needs to be. And I guess that's on the part of the carrier. So this is a complicated industry because now we're talking about the the carrier, not just the person, not just the company making the phone. So maybe we better keep supplements focused on things like you're talking about cases, because it's interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a really good point, and I was thinking about this earlier that you know the tendency could be to just think about what's in your sphere of influence you know what you can actually directly control um, but i was thinking maybe um, what might be more useful is just to say well even if we can't directly influence that now what is still part of the, the bio experience because we might be able to go and partner up with somebody or just dive straight in there and sort out ourselves um, yeah you know, where no one's expecting this to so maybe it seems like you know even so actually no it's not worth a hassle um, yeah, maybe totally agree with that. No, I like that. Cool. Okay, so if we if we maybe put in here then that we've got the option of um um uh, sort of uh, contract um, details. That's probably a rubbish way of saying choose your bum, you know, <laughs> what you want from your phone deal, but um uh and also um See, I've got to try and talk and type and type correctly. And now that's going to work. <laughs> there we go. Um, so now, did you say we were like formally, you're supposed to work through this in a certain order? I mean, we're kind of jumping all over the place in the interest of time, but was did the book cover like the recommended? Yeah, we were supposed yeah. to go left or right. It did say, it did say basically, um, uh, do it in more sort of system and methodical process in terms of start with um, activities that go on pre purchase and purchase and work through, through, and then once you've nailed what activities are okay. there, then start seeing what came to be associated with activities. And I think we're kind of, um, sort of doing a little bit of both all at the same time, but it doesn't, doesn't feel like a bad thing to do. I suppose what you want to do though is have whoever's we, facilitating it, which is me, I suppose, in this case, is to go back through it and make sure that we've, we've covered everything we need to cover. Um, yeah. I, I, I guess from like you know workshops that I've been involved in, it seems you know if people are kind of just going in the right direction, it's nice just to let them flow. And as any, they really they write off pieces have to kind of um, you know get people back on track. But I think this seems to be working okay so far. I mean, it seems what we're doing at the moment is kind of listing activities, but we're kind of implicitly you know we're, we're listing activities here rather than necessarily where I put this column here. I'm just implicitly and prime pain to them, you know, whilst we're talking about the pain, but it's kind of implicitly um, within these tasks, so that you can all sort of identify us. So maybe it's a case of, once we've done this bit, we need to maybe actually call out what the pain is about doing this sort of stuff, but um, do we and keep going? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I find a comment if we look on this right. discussion. He said he could suggest a working procedure of getting people to pair up and fill out one column or row mm. and then compiling the results and repeating with new pairs of people. Yeah. So in a workshop, that could be another approach, I guess. Yeah, which uh, would have, you know, I suspect probably unfortunately won't. Um, Unless people, are, unless all the viewers are uh, happy <laughs> to wait for 20 minutes whilst we go and think about this thing, come back. Might be a good point for them, but um, but no, that's, that's a really good point, and I think um, certainly if you're trying to get people to do stuff within a relatively short workshop, if you're going to say have a two-hour or half-day workshop, that would be a really great way of saving some time. I think. Um, 
Because yeah. you know, also, well, this this stuff could be probably quite mentally intensive and work, you know, anything where you have to get them to actively think about stuff, trying to make sure that they don't do too much on a given day is probably a cool thing to try and achieve as well. Um, so, um, should we maybe like get back to the panel? So, like, if we think about say, some kind of key activities that are involved in maybe some of these um, steps, and then um, let, let's try and sort of think about what could be um, happening around um, sort of purchase and delivery, and then maybe we'll start working down the problem. So, I guess we can get rid of this point now because that's going to be both its pre purchase. So, um, purchases, I guess, you either um, buy online and install. And by the way, just to even drill it further, I captured three, if you look in the share window, filled out by our utility maps. And it's like people are putting kind of like red is bad and, and cross is good for this first one. And then on the second one, not everything's filled out and they're actually doing kind of what we do, we're doing now is like questioning uh, the, the, the quality of each of these um, data points. And then in the third one, people are just listing the competitors. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, so then in that in that competitor one, you'd sort of look for the blank squares, I guess. But I like what we're doing because we're what what we're doing, like your second example is highlighting where the opportunities are, which is mm. pretty much the point at this stage, right? Yeah, I mean the the, the um, approach that the um, authors took was to kind of do a, a hybrid of the first two examples here. So you you explicitly call out um, what the pain points are, but then you mark them up and sort of the circle or across. Um, which might be just a nice visual identifier if you're across the other side of the ring you can see where you know where your key opportunity is. Um, but by adding the comments in, um, that's also really helpful. So um, I, I guess color coding stuff could be could be something that's worthwhile doing here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, doing the competitive stuff's quite interesting. So yeah. so this is all for we're seeing the Apple experience, for example, not just across all phones. Um, yeah. I, think so. I guess we should do that, yeah. So yeah. if we're doing that, then we could do both simultaneously by saying, you know, here's that, and then say, are they delivering on that? And if they're not, then we, uh, uh, you know, make the background, you know, red or something like mm -hmm. that as negative or positive. Yeah, that's not good. So, um, yeah, that's great. So I think... Uh, um, Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that works quite well, particularly if you don't want to go back and address it and sort of look, you know, doing these rationalities that, you know, um, it kind of at least gives you a quick sort of call to action of what you need to be talking about around this chart. Um, cool, okay, so, I mean, in terms of sort of pre purchase other than comparing the devices, I mean, I, I, I mean I, I, at least as a start, we've got quite a few things to talk about. So anything else that we haven't really... Uh, I mean, apart from maybe like, you know, dreaming of what you're going to look like when you've got the brand new, uh, you know, iPhone X or 10 or whatever you want to call it in your hand. Yeah. Um, moving across the row, I'm not sure where this fits in, but a big part of getting a new phone is getting all your data off your old phone. So where would that yeah. be? First use or use? Yeah, first use. Yeah, yeah that's like that use, yeah, doesn't it? So I guess that's going to be a... That's like a major activity under... At least your first use. So I guess should, would that come under productivity? Because I guess you can't really do much before else before you kind of do that. So um, in the pre-purchase mode, customer productivity. I'm trying to forget. I remember what. Oh, are we going to fill in the squares under pre-purchase before moving over? I feel like we, we're supposed, if it, you said we're meant okay. to go across, all the way across the left, we, let's attempt to do customer productivity all the way across and see how horrible it is. Yeah. Um, so I think I need to actually put that up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of like breaking what my own plan is, which is actually writing activities in the activities box. 
I might just make it bigger so I don't keep overlooking it. Um, cool, so we've got... Um, yeah, so transferring the current data into new value is definitely a hassle. It's definitely an activity, and that's a lot of hassle. So that can probably actually stay in both, I suspect. Um, uh, I guess you need to just, I mean, there's just the general unboxing experience, isn't it? You know, just getting out of the packet, hoping you don't drop it before you've actually done anything with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. See, seeing how much they're charging on the battery, that sort of stuff. So I guess maybe, maybe, we won't have to go into this details, but you probably would, I suppose, in the uh, real exercise, but maybe just... Um, not to be a stickler, but on 154, so as, a, as a block, so you should put an X in each space where there's a pain point. And on the example on the right that they provide, it's almost like we just are, we should just look at it and say, where are the pain points? X those out and then yeah, well, describe yeah, them. So, yeah, so I was, I was kind of going for sort of, a, um, sort of a hybrid in my mind, which I probably should have told you about before we start going into this, which was um, that if we... So any, anything with text in here would um, presumably get an X. Mm -hmm. and then the idea would be to say that we could just bring down all the pain points um, that could potentially come in here from the various activities, and then we narrow it down to the one thing that we think is causing the most amount of pain. And that's where we can then sort of change that box to have an X in it with just the one sort of comment about that one particular pain point. Um, Got it. Because I think, because I think, I think the way the authors have done it is a nice end point for this document. Um, but when I was kind of working through my head, it seemed like, a, um, you know, because we haven't got post-its here to play around with, this kind of seemed like a, a way of getting around that. Um, but, yeah, this uh, makes sense. Yeah, but I think yeah, these are definitely for you that have like X's in them for sure. So, um, okay, so using the phone, so we've got unboxing, setting the phone up. So we're transferring data to new phone. Um, I, I guess there's just the standard key activities of, of using a phone, isn't it? And we could be here listening to most work if we, if we wanted to. Um, um, it probably would seem like a bit of a waste of time for now. Um, so, so I think we've kind of covered the first four columns. Um, just with the next little bit of time, should we see if there's anything else? Um, but if we could fill them down the columns, if there's any sort of pain that we could quickly call out from any of these stages and um, any of these other other rows. So um, focusing just on the first four? Yeah, so let, let's just maybe okay. like narrow down this section and then just so we can get like a bit of a complete picture. And then if we've got some time, we can maybe move on to this section here. Because um, right. I mean, I mean, ultimately, this is going to, uh, I don't think Apple are going to snap this up and use it to inform their next strategy. So <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's not. Said we can play ball for us. So, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's so, certainly lots of things on here, so that's good. Yeah. So, maybe if we then think about, I think we've got a, um, a good few sort of comments in here, or a good few um, point books in here um, about the pre purchase side of things. Um, yeah, so we've got some pre purchase. Um, what would we say the pain um, is around productivity? So we've, we've said that there's lots of comparison smoke particularly connected to in the store. Um, are there any other sort of specific kind of like efficiency sort of blockers around in the purchasing stuff? Well, it's very expensive. So customer productivity does cover um, saving the customer money. So I think that is a real pain point when you buy a phone is they're just terribly expensive. An Apple phone in particular. Yeah, so the, especially the latest model apparently. Um, so that that's a big pain point and that's an assumption yes. that people take for granted right now is that these phones will cost you $1,000 and that's the way it is. So that could be an opportunity if there was the ability to make a lower cost one that performed well. Right, and they had them early on. It's like now they're like targeting wealthy people. I, my son tells me that there's like kids walking around his middle school with these one thousand dollar phones. I find it just disgusting. 
Okay, so... Yeah, I think under customer productivity, the key thing for me, like I wrote it in the book, was um, it's things that save the customer time, effort, or money. So I think that's fair to put there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, okay, cool. I, I guess, I guess uh, one, I, mean, I don't know if this comes into use um, or maybe purchase, but, but, but there's a part of this process here which is where maybe if you're switching carriers or networks and you need to you know, um, get your um, you know, we have council contract with the post you can activate it, keep your phone number, and that sort of stuff. So uh, I don't know if that would necessarily come down into the uh, sort of yeah. So if you're locked into a contract or something, like something here to capture the issues around the way the contracts? Yeah, well, I was thinking more that. So, so for example, I mean, I, I was thinking more like, um, so when I recently changed my phone, I was out of contracts, so I have quite a lot of freedom to shop around for better contracts in different networks, and I end up switching network. But that involved me going through the process of um, one telling my current supplier, okay, well, I, I just don't, I don't need to do anymore, even though I'm not in contract anymore. But I need like an activation code for my new phone, so I can keep my old number and just move my number across to my new network. Mm. Um, so. So that, that is, I guess it's an efficiency of getting from purchase to use. I don't know which stage it comes in, but it feels, I feel like it needs to be captured somewhere. So I'm just going to stick it here just because that's that. Yeah, I, no, I think that's good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do we think the difference is uh, between simplicity and convenience and saving effort, which are kind of the first three rows? Where, what is simplicity? in this rubric. Simply, it means anything that eliminates or minimizes complexity or mental house hassle. So for... Okay. Uh, <laughs> which oh, is... here it is. Okay, yeah. Yep, sorry. Exhibit H2. <coughs> okay. So, I mean, actually, I think the switching plans thing could fit nicely under simplicity. Mm. That's, that's a real complicated... Yeah. And then convenience is when and where. So that's that really is something different. Okay, this is good. This is helpful to kind of clarify these in our minds, in my mind anyway. Okay, so, um, I mean, I suppose one particular has to potentially, you know, if you are the sort of person that wants to go to a store, um, just to, you know, simulate in your mind and you've got the phone in your hand, that's the one you want. Um, you know, Open the types of stores is an obvious blocker. This is a isn't it? Um, does that sound, sound like you guys? Show that again. So, oh yeah, so I was just kind of sitting back in my life. So, yeah, if, if you're the sort of person that wants to go to the store to buy a phone rather than completely purchase online, um, like the opening hours, you know, if, you, if, if for example, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, you have this eureka moment, like, yep, yeah, I'm definitely buying you know, the next iPhone. But you realize, you know, the nearest iPhone store is not open for another like eight hours or something. Um, you know, you, you might find a lazy mojo and, and sort of change your mind. So that would be so, under convenience, I guess. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking. So like, just the convenience of the, the stores. Um, Isn't that the same? Up. I mean, you need to just move. Too. Oh, I see. Yeah. I mean, just, it seems like the pre purchase and the purchase are the same for convenience. No? Yeah, it's not possible. For pre-purchase, it might be more about like trying the different phones to figure out which one you want. But when you maybe you don't really do that process, you're just somebody who decides you know you want the latest phone, but you're also a person who wants to get it hands-on now. Yeah, and, and and you might be you know toying up between getting a say like a Samsung versus an iPhone, and you're going to have to go to two different stores to do that. Um, whereas you might only then have, once you've made the decision, you might then only have to go back to one. Well, this is one of the for that kind of person. Um, but I think, Risk uh, reduction is pretty good yeah. on the purchase because of the return policy, which I did not actually remember, yeah. but that Jamie just mentioned. Yeah. Um, I guess the final image thing is just, you know, I guess the retail therapy thing is just generally having that, that wave of, of pleasure that you now have this shiny phone in your hands. 
Um, but I, I, I don't think there's what would, what would be a blocker to, to that in, enjoyment. I'm not quite sure at this point. Not in the Apple products. Uh, yeah. <laughs> They're extraordinarily strong on that, I would say. I mean, their customer experience with their Genius Bar, you go in there and they like literally will sit with you and back up your old phone and set up your new phone. I mean, I got all freaked out the last time I was there because I was having issues and they were just so calm. And, uh, you know, I didn't walk out of there until everything was working. And also now they work with all these different carriers. And so that was helpful too. Yeah. And then, so the environmental yeah. friendliness, um, I guess the only thing that I, that's immediately coming to my mind is just say, like, packaging material that's not recyclable. That might go under delivery. Yeah, you're probably right, yeah. Um, I remember there, I don't know if they still do this, but Apple would say, I don't if they would buy back or give or ask you to return in your old phone if you didn't want it. I don't know if they still do that. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, depending on whether they do that, that's a plus for them or it's an opportunity to do it. Yeah, I don't know that they do that anymore. It doesn't Maybe feel... something like ease of trade-in or something could be put under the purchase column there, like ease of... Recycling your own old phone? So, uh, this, I didn't hear you. Oh, I'm, yeah, like ease of recycling your old phone? Reusing or recycling your old phone? Okay. Ooh, okay, so, um, should we move on to the delivery problem? Yep. Oh, okay, so um, customer productivity around the delivery side of things. So, um, I mean, I think my immediate sort of um, information is heading towards convenience in terms of just, you know, the hassle of, you know, if you're getting stuff with it rather than going and getting it, um, uh, just being around for the delivery, um, you know, that's not always an easy, it's always an easy thing. Um, so maybe uh, well, there's the other um, awkward thing about having to stay in to receive the delivery. Right. And so, like, that would be a good area of opportunity potentially if they could say partner with Amazon and you get it from an Amazon locker or you know whatever. Yeah. And also, that would be risk reduction for the theft of your device if you're not home. Risk of theft maybe would be the, the text in that box. Yeah, sure. Yep. And that's a risk for the company and the customer because somebody's paying when if something gets stolen. Yeah. Um, I guess also the, the risk to the final image if you are using a third party supplier, you know, is the packaging there putting your phone into totally breaking the, the sort of brand, uh, branding you're trying to get across. So, uh, uh, um, oh, okay. Is that kind of cover this point? Uh, looking at the definition of, of what these um, utility levers are talking about, um, I mean, is, is there a lot of means and hassle associated with getting something delivered? Not, not for me. No, but or this is maybe for like, the delivery person. Um, if you buy, I guess in some ways you would have to. If you're doing this in real life, you'd have to break it down into like in-store purchase versus buying online, because like the issues are different for both. But you can buy it online and pick it up at the store. So I feel like they they uh, dealt with that. Yeah, but it raises an interesting point though in terms of let, let's say for example you are comparing multiple journeys. Um, if you then are trying to highlight where's the biggest pain point, 
if you start picking pain points from different journeys, um, you know, what, what does that mean for you in terms of how you then sort of move on to the next steps of trying to sort of make recommendations? Because you might be solving part of the problem for one journey um, and part of the problem for that journey, not actually um, solving anything completely. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if that, if that gets put back in that section of the book. But, um, yeah. But I think, yeah, you're right, you, you would naturally want to consider all the different options here. Um, you say that this trip, particularly if, you know, a company, let's say, for example, Amazon doesn't offer, um, you know, multiple different services under different brands. You know, it's a one-stop shop for everything, isn't it? So, you know, it should be a seamless experience for them, regardless of what, you know, how you use that, really. Um, yep. So, I, okay, so um, let's maybe move on to the use column. And so, um, so we've already got a few things filled in here for cost effectivity and simplicity. Is there anything that's kind of um, stopping us um, using a phone uh, sort of whenever you want it or want to do it? Um, I guess, uh, I mean, I'm not necessarily that from first use, but certainly during use. Um, I don't know if that maybe counts as maintenance, but um, forgetting your charger. Because mm. um, phones and chargers basically might as well be one and the same object because you can't really go out and leave home without both of them you know, for a free extended period of time. Mm. Well, and here's another question. Like, what after we get this whole map filled in, what is the next step? I sort of missed that. Like, is there a point where we would go through this and figure out which is the key pain point? Or? Yeah, that, that would be it. I mean, do you, do you want to try that? They say maybe just the, the, the pre purchase column and see, see how that process works now. Yeah, I think that would be good. Like we have enough here to I agree. get a feel for it. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm good. I mean, uh, I don't know if they explicitly called out the book. I don't think they did, but this sort of seems like it would lend itself quite well to like a dog coating sort of system. Um, or just like a hands in the air type thing. So, um, okay, so if we look at the, the pre purchase column, then, so basically the, the pain points that we've got so far are saying that we're overwhelmed by the options. Um, that the actual hassle of getting to a phone store, um, if you want to compare models, um, you can't easily test a phone. Um, so, you know, there's an element of risk in, in when you decide which one you're going to get. And then there's a difficulty in looking further at the supply chain to see whether you know, the phone has been ethically sourced or not. So, um, of those options, um, Jane, which one do you think is your, is your major pain point? <laughs> Me? Yeah. Of the pre-purchase? Yeah. I would say the top one, uh, comparing them, uh, yeah, really understanding uh, which is the right phone for me with my mm -hmm. lifestyle. Like, I, I feel like I bought a phone my iPhone 8 and I'm unhappy with it because of the form factor it I went from a 5 to an 8 and this and even though it's easier to read and type it's constantly falling out of my pocket and, and landing on the on the ground and it's just too big and bulky and, and I definitely uh, regret purchasing it um, just on that alone and what, what I think I might have just actually got myself confused on is that um, I, I think potentially you could have like crosses and pain points in, in any of these set of six boxes, in, in all of them potentially. Um, so I think what we would need to do is if, say, there was multiple pain points in, in a given cell, um, I think we would need to strip this down to one. But it's within the pre purchase column, we've only got one pain point um, okay. in each of the boxes. So I think we could probably just say that those are the pain points, if that makes sense. Okay. So if, if we if we take say um, the customer productivity row for the purchase um, part of the journey, we've got three different sort of pain points to, to choose between. So maybe if we maybe just for this particular exercise, say which of those three pain points in that um, other red box are, um, you know, are those three versions the worst? 
I'm so I'm still a little confused. Like <laughs> I'm not sure we have to actually like I choose any of these, right? Is it is the point to just complete the math um, and then go on to the next steps? Well, I, I think the ultimate game is to ultimate is to have um, the key pain point. Um, because uh, if you look at the template that the um, authors have produced, they have a, a, a cross in, or, um, in any box that's got some pain associated with it, with a, um, a O um, for um, where the, well, as the key says there, where the utility the space, space yeah. where the industry company focuses on. But next to each of these crosses in the O, they've got, um, they've actually got the pain point or the blocker listed. So, um, in my mind, it was a case of, okay, well, once we have a list of potential pain points, we need to just decide which of those is the most important and what would end up pitching on these little comment boxes. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Okay. On page 156, they say, with that done, shift to the completed buyer utility map asking, what, by contrast, does the map we collectively created reveal? Is the industry knowingly or unknowingly imposing pain points? Or on buyers across their total experience? Could these pain points be limited by current customers? Use of our industry's product or service? Would existing customers jump ship and champion an organization that eliminated these blocks? Could these blocks to utility be discouraging or intimidating? How many of the 36 utility spaces does our industry generally focus on? And as one exec put it, while answering this last question, we are here pointing to two utility spaces on the map. When there's all that out there dragging his fingers across all the X's on the rest of the map, then when's the team when that that's when the team first begins to appreciate and see the real possibility of creating blue ocean. Okay. But so but it may be that this is still part of their like mind opening motivational phases of we're just kind of looking at this whole thing. Like we're not picking one to move on in the next step. I think that's right because then I think in this in the next chapter it becomes a process of like simultaneously exploring many of these. True. I think. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's hard to think, you know. The next yeah, one's going into non-customers, so not actually. Uh, we're going to be moving into something very different. So. Well, we, but I think you'd have to do that. You're right, Mimi. I think you'd have to sort of say, okay, well, let, let's see what scope there is in, in all of these to, to do something about it. Because, you know, what, why, why just choose one pen book to solve if you can solve, you know, you know, multiple ones? Right. And I think the other thing is that this is still somewhat hypothetical because this is based on the team's intuition. And the next step, I know because I looked ahead slightly, is very much about going out into the field and it's this incredibly labor-intensive, much more labor-intensive seemingly process to figure out what what you're hearing from actual people, and then maybe you're coming back and mapping back to this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, and, and I think they can talk about it in, in the section of the um, really very intensive, you know, doing that bit of private research to help out about this, but. But I, th I think the important thing is, you know, and you read this in other sorts of texts where they say, you know, just because you've now created a document doesn't mean to say you shouldn't come back to it and find it um, if you think it needs to be fun. So I think yeah, it's, it's an important thing to say, I think. So, um, but I mean, I, I think also as well, because, you know, we, we're trying to cram, you know, potentially a day's worth of work into 30 minutes. <laughs> it's going right. to be, uh, you know, it's, it's never going to be uh, the finished article, but... I think all those other questions that you just listed out in the book, um, you know, are really good things to talk, talk about, and I don't think we're going to have time to kind of cover that stuff today. Um, but that would be a really good next step to do once this has been fleshed out a little bit more. Um, yeah. But I could, I could see this could be, you know, you know, like you've been saying, maybe that quite a motivating exercise for people to run through. Um, and, and, and I think all that book may along with this an idea of humanness is to encourage sort of trust in each other and, and confidence to be open about opinions and stuff. Um, you know, and, and when we're sort of, you know, if you really want to try and get better, it seems the best way to do that is just to lay everything on the table and yeah. just realise you could do things better, but then so could everyone else, so you just need to get a bit better than you um, and that's okay. Yeah, I like it a lot because 
um, you know, by having, um, I mean, imagine if we were in a workshop doing, going through this, I, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the customer journey maps, uh, because they take forever and, you know, the diagramming, I'm, I'm a big spreadsheet fan and I like that, you know, kind of, regardless of whether we went across or down, um, but that we sort of discuss things, you know, from, you know, the cradle to grave, from the beginning to the end of the experience at these different levels, as opposed to the journey map process. Um, I thought opened my mind of all kinds of cool ways that they could be innovative. Mm -hmm. And David weighed in too. I don't know if you guys saw in the comments. He said also he agrees it's mind opening and based on the team's intuition. So I think we have reached consensus at least on the purpose of the buyer utility map. <laughs> Yay, we did something. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to go through the exercise. I think that was really helpful. Yeah, no, I, was, I mean, I know this isn't the finished house for and, and um, what well, so it, it, this might not be a, 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 a useful thing to do, um, but I was thinking that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I hadn't read the next section, so I don't know what's coming up, but um, it would seem like a nice idea to sort of carry this process through the rest of the sessions, you know, do something that's been and work with mm. it, so it's a pretty good. Um, whether we stick with this example or whether we can do something better, I don't know, but... Um, so I don't, don't hijack your, uh, your book project, I mean, it's your... <laughs> well, no, let, really cool. yeah, let's see. I mean, as we start reading the next chapters, let's, let's see if, like, we should keep referring to this and using this case study uh, as an example for going forward, I think would be a good, uh, a good, a good approach. Yeah, the next section is very research intensive, so I'm not sure how that would work exactly, but we can see. Yeah, it, it, it can get pretty cold and wet here at night time, so I don't really want to go outside and then yeah. the darkness if I don't have to looking for someone to talk to. So. <laughs> I would be asking a bit much. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't think that laptop is closely running again, so but I will try that last time. So, um, but I think, I mean, I, I think we've kind of reached like a natural sort of stop point for this exercise. You guys think so? Yeah, yeah. totally. Okay. Well, right. I mean, I think it's been really useful. I mean, just to sort of, uh, um, I, I guess to summarize my thoughts, and it'd be good to hear your thoughts on this as well, like in terms of the fact that, you know, we just talked about this is a, you know, in the face of it, a very useful method to do, particularly from the sort of, you know, opening up the perspective of it. And, and it'd be, it would have been interesting as well if we had the time to move on to the, the non customer uh, method as well, because I think that also is a, a really good eye opening or mind opening. Um, methods, um, but I, I think what's what just generally you think about my experience of reading the book now is that um, now we're starting to get into the meat of the process a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm really enjoying reading the the, um, the book um, and getting to understand the process a bit better. I mean, I, I think generally the authors work pretty well; they're pretty concise um, and they use examples well. Um, they, they introduce their case studies well. I've read quite a few books where people tend to repeat the same points a few times in just slightly different ways um, for seemingly not a lot of reason. Um, so I, I appreciate that the authors have done that. Um, but and I, I mean, it's making me look forward to, I mean, th this is a bit of fire under me to go and, go and read the next section now. So um, yeah, that, that's what I have to say. Do you guys have any other thoughts you'd like to ask? I mean, I think one thing we could do, since I believe the next section itself won't be a good group activity, maybe we could do the customers as the activity next time, and then, you know, talk through the methodology of step four. Sure. Yeah. That seems like a good idea. And if we need if, to revisit... It turns out that it doesn't lend itself well to a group activity. Right. And we could revisit, because I do see you're right, Melanie, uh, the non-customers is actually part of step three. Whoops. It's only seven pages. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I thought it was, I, I found that interesting, like, oh, we're talking about not customers, this is the jobs to be done theory, uh, not, not mentioned, but yet there's so much overlap between design thinking and jobs theory and all these other ones. Um, you know, and I found this, because I know, you know, like I was just scanning uh, Eventbrite for, 
events besides ours and there is like actually people out there trying to do yeah. blue ocean ship training sessions and they're literally like know how to position it compared to design thinking lean startup and open out evaluation uh -huh. you know and uh it's funny it's just it's interesting that people are trying to uh do these workshops and so for me this is very valuable to I don't think I could have done this on my own. So thank you everybody for your participation. Thank you for organizing us. Yeah, that's no, great. Thank you. All right. Well, let's sign off hey. and I'll see. I, I promise you my audio will work next time. What happened, uh, anyway, I did a few mistakes here, so I would have had to reboot and I didn't want to reboot. So I stayed listening. But next time my audio will work. That's good, awesome. David. Thanks, <laughs> David. Oh, there yeah. you are. All right, everybody, have a fantastic right, take care, guys. week. All right, bye. Yeah, bye. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.